Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. So my topic is a nutrition in special situation, and it's a quite an a, a heterogeneous topic because only the um, uh, binding link over is the nutrition. So, uh, so that I'm not endorsing any brands, but telling the brands is a part of this because there are very uh, limited options available. Uh, so I'll be covering uh, nutrition in special situation. Uh, it's a long topic. I will like to rush fast and try to cover as many as I can. So I'll be covering mainly the, how, uh, about the percutaneous endoscopic gastropathy. That is how we especially intervention for achieving the enteral nutrition. Uh, in more area of uh, metabolism, nutritional aspects of that, short bowel syndrome and surgical one, neonatal cholestasis, and if possible, the built protein allergy. So, uh, so in the workshop from yesterday, you must be knowing how you are assessing the uh, nutrition. So nutrition assessment, I'm not going much detail, but it does just doesn't stop at the anthropometric assessment. In neurology, there are different uh, parameters, but apart from that, we can also assess it by biochemical uh, markers. There can be instrumental evaluation and also in the elder ones or even the, uh, the new, uh, functional assessment like hand grip strength and the frailty. There are no few studies even in the children for about the hand grip strengths, though it's not been standardized. Now, uh, let's go to the uh, topics for this. So, uh, this is basically a per, uh, cutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy uh, tube feeding. So, basically, main indications are when there is indication for the gastric enteral feed and the, and the particular patient is not able to uh, take it and, uh, orally, then yes, the, and then the stomach, and suppose sometimes you want to do a stomach decompression. These are the basic main indications. There can be multiple causes for which we might have to do it. The contraindications are if there are serious coagulation disorders, hemodynamic instability, sepsis, severe ascites, peritonitis, some interposed organs, uh, gastric outlet obstructions, gastroparesis. Uh, these are the major contraindications. And yes, uh, any procedures can have some complications as well that can be a major and minor. If properly done, major compl complications are rare, but minor like wound care and all these generally are uh, sortable. So generally, we don't find this uh, major uh, complications if the uh, procedure is done well uh, and they are followed well. So advantage is basically it's a low cost intervention, less invasive this, can be placed without uh, general anesthesia and no need of laparotomy. So it's the save cost and steep. Uh, so uh, generally, uh, so the indications in the neonatologies are different, but for the older infants, if you are having any uh, disease where the disease is not curable, uh, there are, and there is no, uh, if your child is requiring a nasogastric feeding more than six to eight weeks, generally we, uh, advised to go ahead with the uh, gastrostomy tube feed because uh, of uh, several advantage. One, uh, so with a persistent tube can cause increase the reflux. Uh, then there is a nasal blockage, and also uh, of those patients uh, who are as uh, the neurodevelopmental issues, the caregivers' uh, feeding time is significant. It goes to 30 minutes, 45 minutes, or in the recurrent uh, pneumonias. In those special situations, we do uh, advise them to go ahead with the pectin sessions. So there are different methods uh, like the pull technique, push technique, and either you can use the newer one that's an introducer uh, technique. The pull technique is very simple, and we do it in an endoscopic suit. We don't need an OT. So in a, we just, after the endoscopy, we select a trans area in the epigastric region. The procedures perform under strict aseptic precautions. And through an endoscope, we go into the stomach and the needle is basically inserted into the stomach and a guide wire is uh, through a forcep which is introduced to the scope, guide wire is pulled into the, at the mouth and then a tube, this is a PEC tube, which is pulled from the skin surface in the epigastric. And that's a pull technique. Push technique differs from the second stage where instead of pulling it, similar tube is pushed inside. So I'll just show a video. So here I am in this, uh, the stomach and one forcep is there. Indentation is uh, seen and the stomach. Then a, need, a needle is introduced. And through the then a trocar is kept there after the needle introduction. The uh, guide 
wire is then grasped with the help of a smear or forceps, whatever the same you have, and then it is uh, taken out. So it's a very simple procedure. And once the guide wire is out from over the guide wire, you can uh, one can basically uh, pull the tube. Only the issue is there is a there can there is a risk of oral contamination. Uh, so the apparel procedure antibiotics will be required. So it's, uh, it is can be easily done. Uh, so this is how the tube is placed. So this is quite an older case. Generally, we have till seven kgs and all. Uh, this is the youngest uh, we have put. But the, even in the three three point five kgs kids, it can be placed. And uh, for this age, generally a 12 French tube is sufficient. So the advantage are it avoids aspiration. One can give a balanced diet. One can give an even higher fiber diet. So it can prevent constipation in this field. Even the kitchen feeds can be given. So the cost of the nutrition decreases. And it, of course, saves the feeding time of the caregiver. So more time can be given to a physiotherapy and other aspects of the care. Now, there is a study which was published uh, for the infants. So, in this, uh, the center from the Italy, almost 36% of the kids who underwent this uh, procedure were the infants. And the median age at least was placed for 114 days, and the median age was 5.1 kg. If you see the indication, the 48% were because of an HIE, and the other were other malformations, you have the metabolic disorders, chronic lung disease, any uh, uh, myopathies. Other. So mean duration, so the procedure time was not very high, just 16 minutes, and in, in the field where could be initiated in a two days time. And there were very minor complications, there was hardly any major complication. And the one uh, important thing is after, so it is a tube, so it has some uh, life, so after average of a five to six months, we need to change it to a low profile device. So generally in the average time of five months or so, we need to be converted into uh, a low profile device that we call as a VT button. So the limitation of the tube is sometimes that it needs a, a GA and when we are converting from a PET tube to the low profile device, you need another endoscopic procedure. So another admission, another GA and sometimes those patients with a progressive uh, neurological disorder, they may need a prolonged ventilation or some, uh, some hours of the ICU stay. So now what uh, we do is basically we can now introduce this uh, 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 Mickey button directly by using an introducer kit. So this is the kit that we get. So there are this blue colored one are the suture materials. There are uh, safety plexi uh, sutures. And there is uh, this long one is a dilator, trocar dilator, which is used for severe dilatation. So, and this is basically a uh, balloon guided tube, or we can use a Mickey button also. This is how the low profile device looks. So, this is this balloon internally is fixed into the inner side of the gastric wall, and this portion is outside. So, this is only this much portion. So, outside this, only this uh, pores are there. So, it's very easy for the parents for if they are going under, uh, they are undergoing physiotherapy and all. So, there is no tube is hanging and this tube is detachable which can be attached and can be used for the feeding. Now in India at the moment because of the low we are only getting a 24 French dilator which is only for the adult so it's quite big but we are still, we are able to use it till a 7 kg of uh, kids also but probably uh, if the further the smaller diameters are launched we might be able to use it for the, even the younger babies. So how we do this procedure? So this is again on the endoscope, we are in the uh, stomach. We confirm the indentation. So then we have basically, we anchor the anterior wall of the stomach and the abdominal wall with the three uh, suture that is called as the TPXC sutures. So there are small needles. So the needles are introduced. And uh, uh, there is one anchor is there to the suture materials is anchor uh, and it is anchored uh, like this. So you can see the introduction of the first needle here. Yeah. 
yeah this is the first needle and then the suture is released from this needle so somehow i'm not able to fast forward it to save the time on this so this is how It's getting, it's not progressing. Okay, so we place the three, uh, three sutures uh, like that, and then from the center of these three sutures, uh, we place uh, another guide wire, and then there is a serial dilatation is done, and then directly the meaty button can be placed over here. So, so, so this, so from the outer surface, these are the three suture material which are placed, and we can put directly. The Mickey button. The advantage of this is one is a single endoscopy procedure is required. If you are using a routine PET tube, probably for smaller kid, we can use a 24 frame, uh, sorry, a uh, 12 frame. But with this uh, introducer kit, we can directly use a 24 frame tube for placement. So it's a big port which is a tube. So uh, uh, later on, whenever we are transi uh, transition is going from the liquid diet to the semi solid diet. So it is a thicker feed, more calorie dense feeds can be given. And uh, the second procedure is not required to convert the PEC tube to a uh, Mickey button. So it definitely saves one more admission, one more general anesthesia, and it's quite helpful for those children who has a progressive neurological disorder. So now uh, let's move on, to, move on to the second topic that was the nutrition in, uh, in more error of metabolism. Again, it's a very long topic. I try to focus on few important aspects uh, in this. So, when we are dealing with an IEM in a neonatal age group, so so they present so the presentation it can be an intoxication syndrome like urea cycle defects, organic acidemia, fatty acid oxygen defects, or there can be a reduced tolerance uh, to the fasting like glycogen storage disorders, fatty acid oxygen disorder in higher uh, in the infantile hyperinsulinism, or sometimes there can be uh, energy depletion. Uh, uh, disorders like uh, pyrogenic residual deficiencies or mitochondrial diseases, and there can be some uh, like a pyridoxin dependent epilepsy the disorders of neurotransmission, and there are some disorders where not much of the intervention is useful, like Rosenheim disorders. So whenever the patient, which I'm not going to the details of the clinical presentation, but when the kids, uh, when this babies present with an emergency, there is some set of uh, blood investigations that we do. That's from the blood and the urine. It's in any standard textbooks. Uh, depending on that, we try to classify like what kind of disease probably I may be dealing with, whether I may be dealing with organ cathedemia, MSUDs, urea cycle defects, and any uh, carbohydrate uh, metabolism disease, fatty acid oxidation, or mitochondrial disorders. And then we decide like how to go ahead. The goals of the treatment here is the first is to ensure the basic life support. Of course, they need to be in a good uh, facility where is the good NICU backup. To provide sufficient energy supply, prevent accumulation of the toxic metabolites, correct acid base balances, and introduce the supportive therapies like uh, treat infections, manage convergence, and supply the cofactors, which is generally even empirical. So the first stage is you stop the feeding and you a high uh, rate of the glucose. Then uh, second stage is the correct acid base metabolism, ensure good hydration, correct all the electrolytes. Look for any hyperammonia states because that can directly correlate to the survival. If you are not able to manage ammonia, whatever you do, you are going to lose the child. So they will need either the peritoneal dialysis or depending on the age, might be more dialysis also. So, uh, so try to detoxify the ammonia and can use arginine, citrulline, sodium benzoates. Uh, so, or if you require peritoneal dialysis or hemodialysis. Uh, then promote, and once the acute phase is over, we concentrate on the promotion of anabolism by giving glucose, glucose, lipids, if we are not suspecting fatty acid oxygen defects, so that there is good calories are given. After 48 hours, at least start 25 to 50% of the RDAs of the protein, because we don't give it, fearing that supplementing the protein will increase the encephalopathy, there is a degradation of their endogenous proteins, and that will again we are going to worsen the uh, nutritional status. For uh, urea cycle defect, we restrict all amino acids. And if you know a specific organ acidemia, we can restrict the specific amino acids. And of course, uh, other supportive medications we go ahead. 
Now, this emergency management is the standard one, not going through in the details of all these emergency managements. Uh, metabolic emergency drugs, again, this list is available in all the standard uh, references. So uh, one should know the doses and you should know how to reach the pharmacy to avail this because when you are managing this patient, it's always the race against the time. Uh, now, we are, uh, now, when uh, the acute phase is over, we focus on the nutrition of the kids. So we should know what are the uh, needs of for the anabolism uh, when the patient is in the infection, in the acute illness. So these needs are a little bit different from the standard uh, one. So just refer and just try to see what are the, as per the age, what will be the required. Uh, now, when you are focusing on the enteral nutrition, there are different kinds of formulas, which I think Dr. Marty was also uh, getting. So we have one is an elemental formula, similar elemental formulas, polymeric formulas, and there is a protein substitute. So polymeric formulas are those uh, formulas which we use routinely, routinely where the carbohydrate fat metabolism, the macronutrients are present in the natural form, there is a polypus. Okay, so there will be non hydrolyzed proteins and the carbohydrate product by microtextins and oligosaccharides, uh, triglycerides, are the, uh, these are the uh, fat proportion. When they have been broken down to the pieces, we already get either uh, partially hydrolyzed formulas, extensively hydrolyzed formulas, or elemental formulas. So, in partially and extensively hydrolyzed formulas, we get oligopeptides. In elemental formulas, we get a single individual amino acid formulas, and the sugar can be either the maltodextrins or can be the glucose polymers, which can be again single. And the lipids is source uh, by either the medium or long chain triglycerides. Now, as we go on and decreasing the size of the macromolecule to the micro or even the single one, the osmolality goes up. So we have to see the enteral tolerance, and also generally when you are in metabolic disease, they don't have much of the enteral issues. But when you are using these formulas for an surgical gut, short gut, there we need to consider uh, this uh, osmolality aspect. Uh, and then these are the protein substitute or the medical foods that is used for uh, the, patient, uh, the patient who have the metabolic uh, diseases. So one can use an elemental amino acids or one can use uh, uh, the individual uh, free amino acid which can be a mixture and where whenever a particular disease condition is that particular group of uh, amino acids is given less and it is considered as uh, the other essential amino acids are supplied. So that's how we have a, this is a basic understanding of the formulas that are available for the enteral nutrition in this forsaceous patient. Uh, so we know that the protein anabolism, so there are three aspects. So just by giving protein anabolism is not going to generate the uh, just uh, protein supplement. So you need to be, provide good amount of calories only then the anabolism will be there. So we need to have carbohydrate, proteins, and you see that will, going, that's going to synthesis, uh, stimulate the protein synthesis. And uh, so, so you have, so, uh, so what happens if we give an unbalanced nutrition? So, you know, if you're given adequate, there's a normal growth. But if there is an imbalance, so, so if you are giving more protein but not giving enough calories, so your protein are going to get wasted and you are going basically have costly calories because they are going to get converted into the uh, energy utilization. So, if you are going, uh, giving less protein, then again, the, the child is not going to get, uh, gain the protein uh, muscle mass, but is going to uh, gain the fat. So that's why the balance energy is very important. Uh, and you need to take the help of an expert nutrition. That is very important. As a clinician, we cannot do this, but we need to understand so that we know that what is happening is in the right direction. And as a clinician, can you suggest any tweaking into the diet? So that's why we need to understand uh, the uh, diet in the special situation. So uh, basically, the general uh, tips are we generally try to provide sufficient medical food uh, to meet the needs, try to see the protein requirement as per the uh, specific condition. So most of the guidelines are based on the phenylketone urea studies. Uh, so and, and the more important is do not over prescribe the medical food because they are uh, costly. You see, uh, the uh, whenever there is an increased caloric need, depending on the stress and when there are the conditions where you need to restrict the particular uh, uh, amino acids. So, how to assess the protein uh, sufficiency? We can assess biochemically by measuring the particular amino acids in the question. The albumin and of course the blood urea nitrogen and parameters you all know 
And then again, on the clinical assessment is very important whether the, there are any clinical symptoms of a myeloid patient. So let's uh, quickly go through few special conditions and let's see uh, how we go. Suppose we had a child with MSUD and the child is stable and after stabilization, you want to introduce the uh, diet. So, uh, so this the goal is to maintain this UC in isovalin and valine. So individual assessment is not required, but if you do measure a plasma and acid, yes, you will get this uh, levels. Uh, with, uh, so, so age, uh, as per age, we try to see, okay, how much leucine is required, how much intact protein is required, how much total protein is required. So, so with this intact protein, you see how much, whether this minimum required leucine is getting, uh, this, this requirement is met or not. Once that has been uh, done, then you, the, then we supply the remaining protein with the medical food to meet the nutritional goal. And after that, we calculate the remaining energy required and use the appropriate fat and carbohydrate to meet the goal. So the formulas are there by different companies. So Abbott, Mid Johnson's, DN stands for Denon Nutrition and is the pristine. I think in 2017, 18, these formulas were launched, but however, they have been withdrawn because of uh, a number of reasons. Now, the, yeah, the pristine ones are available and they are quite uh, cheaper uh, and affordable. Uh, so that's how, uh, with the help of uh, expert dietitian, you can calculate this and you can use this formula. They are available in India. Uh, so whenever there is an illness, decrease the protein by 50%, increase the medical food, and in, you can increase the energy by increasing the carbohydrates and the fats. Now, if you are dealing the child with uh, organic acidemias. Again, here the goal is to maintain plasma amino acids in a normal range. So here, again, we see what should be the total protein and intact protein, and then you see what is the calorie. So again, through the intact protein, uh, we'll see uh, how much we can do and whether the plasma amino acid levels in the blood is measured. It's a trial and error method. So, and number of things beside it, what's the catabolism, what's the basically a uh, basic metabolic rate of the child and how is the liver is going to handle each and each amino acid. So you calculate the intact protein requirement and what is the remaining you add by the medical food and rest of the calories you uh, fulfill with the uh, other like the fats and the uh, carbohydrate. So the formulas for this, uh, again, uh, the Abbott, MGN and nutrition are not available and the pristine ones are there available. But this group will definitely need carnitine, biking and B12. Now for tyrosinemias, we do see these children quite uh, frequently. So there's a plasma amino acid uh, so the plasma phenylalanine tyrosine should be maintained. So that's the goal. So here, uh, important is when they are coming in the crisis situation, keep them NPO. Uh, you can get the uh, and once they are stable, uh, one can again. So you see what is how much uh, phenylalanine the child is getting from the um, uh, the, in the diet. Again, the same use the same step and meet the other needs. And there are the special formulas which will be free of the specific amino acids. And the nitisol, so here in the tyrosinemia, apart from the diet, you need to give nitisinol, which is again, it is now launched in India. Two years prior, the cost used to be very high. Now it is almost decreased to almost 50%. Now here, if the child is presenting to you and is less than six months, it's very important to identify this kids at early age. Uh, you can definitely start nitisone as a special diet and probably the cirrhosis can get reversed and child will have a good long-term survival with the nitisone. But suppose you're diagnosing the child a little bit late, but eight months, nine months. So cirrhosis is already set. This can, the kids with these conditions are already with a high risk for an HCC. These kids have a micro hepatocellular carcinoma of 0.5 mm or not. So these are just seen in the explants when kids are undergone the transplant as young as one and a half years. There have been India studies which has shown that. So once you, when the cirrhosis is set in, then even if you provide this, you may achieve a metabolic stabilization in the initial months or years of the treatment, but on the long term, these children are going to get decompensated because of cirrhosis, and they may still develop or have an HCC, and you may get a surprise at five years, six years. Because HCC is a slow-growing tumor, so uh, with the tumor which is already spread and is an uh, unsalvageable case. So and those children generally who present late, yes, we use this to stabilize them, but after that, this this, this kind of kids. Uh, can need a transplant if they present at the older age.
So our goal is to identify an early, also we have to see the long-term cost. Now, the kids with a uh, urea cycle uh, defects, so the goal is to maintain the normal ammonia. Uh, we have already uh, seen the emergency management here. Again, the procedure is the same. Calculate the uh, need through the intact protein and uh, you see whether the essential amino acid has been maintained or not. Maintain ammonia as a normal. Even if it's supposed they're clinically asymptomatic and, you, and ammonia is high, so these children can have a learning disabilities. They can have a behavioral problem. They are hyper. They have a, they are they behave like an ADHD kid. So so long term uh, good neurological survival is also important for the kids. And sometimes they have severe anorexia, so they can need an enteral support by either tube feeding or gastrostomy feeds. Uh, the formulas are are available for this. And uh, one need to supplement L arginine, uh, except in the L arginine deficiencies, citrulline, and nitrogen spazing medications, which has been already mentioned into the uh, previous tables. Now, the launch in acyl coenzyme A deficient, uh, dehydrogenase deficiencies, again, they present as whenever there's a long term of fasting is there. Again, here we need to see how much LCT to meet the goal from the diet. Supply 50% from the LCT, supply 50% from the MCT, and then remaining of the uh, energy need, you need from the protein and the carbohydrate uh, need. Uh, again, therefore, the formulas are available. And what is important once you diagnose it, so, so there is a, some specific period of a meal per mouth. I mean, the, uh, uh, this can be tolerated. Younger the kid, smaller the interval. As the kid grows, maybe around eight hours of fasting can be tolerated. But beyond that, avoid it. Uh, and these needs, they uh, can DHA supplementation may be required once you are restricting the LCT. Just presenting one case. So it's a, basically a small boy, third degree consanguinity. Uh, and this child presented with an ascites, uh, sepsis, lethargy, uh, dehydration and this uh, child was from Surya Hospital of the Surya So uh, this at the bedside, this child has a cataract and there's a neonatal cholestasis six degree. So you know it's a cataract sick child is in a galactosemia, but other problems like if you don't recognize in the neonatal screening, so the child presented with IV hemolysis, proximal renal tubular cirrhosis, ascites, sepsis, was pneumonia. Fortunately, this child didn't have a meningitis. So this child's and this 